Father, we thank you and we adore you with our hearts, with our voices. Like the wise men, Father, we come with all of ourselves, our gold, our frankincense, our myrrh. We want to be generous to you, Father, and adore you because you are such a generous God to us. I thank you for sending your Son to come to earth and to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as we adore Christ this morning, I wanted to thank again our church for just being so incredibly generous. We have had a giving tree out for the last month, and one of our visions as a church, even from the early days, was to give here, near, and far. And so those gifts for the giving tree go to families here in the city at the City Gospel. They go to inter-parish ministries and families related to their, their ministry, as well as to Happy Church. And so just over the last month, we've had 858 families who are going to have a Christmas with their family getting gifts because of your generosity. So thank you for your continued and the way in which we're giving back to the community. So thank you for that. You know, part of why we study the Bible each week is to learn about a generous God, but not just for its own sake. We also want to be generous people. And Christmas certainly is a time of invitation. God inviting people to know him. The wise men, the shepherds, Mary, Joseph, to know him at a more intimate level. And that has certainly been our heartbeat as a church. We want people to come to know him. I mentioned last week that part of our journey over the last 15 years of inviting people to know him in a yours to explore environment has been going from one service to two to three to four services. And I had a greeter, I think it was uh, three weeks ago, told me that our 10 o'clock service, they brought somebody in, there was no seats, even with our new rows and our new seats on the side. And so they walked him back out of the chapel at 10 o'clock, came to the hearth room, completely full Walked him out to the fireplace area. We have headsets we bought several years ago because it's hard to hear out there. And there's no headsets available. And they're then going to walk up to the skybox to watch the service. And they're like, you know, never mind. We'll just not come back. And I thought, well, what a tragedy. And what a great problem to have, right? Too many people want to come to know Jesus. Too many people want to explore their faith. I felt a little bit like the bad guy in the, children, in the, uh, in the Christmas story or the innkeeper. There's no room for you in the inn. You know, we don't want to be that guy. So part of what our leadership came and told us, and I mentioned last week, is that we feel like, especially with our attendance being at its high point, January through March, that we need to raise about a million dollars to add an additional environment here within the church footprint. And that's going to cover video cameras and LED screens and video production rooms. But we feel like in the same way, for the last 10 years, we've always been focused on guests. If you've been attending Horizon for a while, you know what it's been like for people to give so you can have an environment to serve you so you can feel welcome. It's kind of a chance for you to say, welcome to the family. And as part of the family, let's give and serve so other people can have an environment in the future. So we want to add 20% capacity and a a sought-after space in the room. If that's something you're interested in doing, I just ask you to pray about that for the next few weeks and months. Uh, It's going to be a combination of a million-dollar capital campaign, which is going to require a few $100,000 to $300,000 gifts, some $10,000 to $100,000 $100,000 gifts and then many, many you know, dollar to $10,000 gifts that can be done as a, a lump sum or as a you know, monthly or yearly pledge. It's really customizable up to you, whatever God leads you to do. And we also feel like as we do that, if we get that many more families, we're going to need additional children's support and tech support and even have a live band with a, a uh, projected uh, screen of the speaking. And so that's going to be about 200000 additional cost per year in our operational fund. So as you're praying about that in the next few weeks and months, I would just ask you to think about and ask God how you might want to serve others the way you've been served, to be generous to others the way God's been generous to you. Uh, three ways you can give. Uh, one, you can go to horizoncc.com backslash giving. You can fill that out. You can make a note, the future giving fund versus the general operational fund. Or you can text GIVE to 513-817-0014. Or, of course, you can write a check. And you can make a distinction there where you're giving to. So let's pray and just thank God. What a great problem to have. You know, there's a lot of my friends who are in board meetings in their churches talking about how to keep the doors open, not talking about how to create more space for people who want to know God and know the Bible. So it's pretty exciting. So let's pray together. Father, so humbled by your faithfulness, so humbled that you took these environments we've created and we've tried to put in your hands and doing verse-by-verse Bible teaching and creating environments for our friends to come to know you. And you continue to draw people to this place. So, Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your generosity to us. And show us how we can go and do unto others as you've done unto us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, Chad. You know, as you think about those wise men, they traveled a long way. And they gave really generously. 
Why would they do that? And then you think about those shepherds. And they left their sheep alone in a field with nobody to protect them to go and find some little baby in a town called Bethlehem. Why would they do that? And then you think about Mary and Joseph and how their lives were completely changed when this little baby showed up. And you know, we've been calling this part of our journey through Luke, what child is this? And we hear that phrase a lot at at this season because it's a lyric in a Christmas carol. But that question and the answer to that question mattered a lot to the people who were around Jesus at his birth. Right? It mattered a lot to those wise men if they were going to come that far or give that generously. It mattered what child is this really if those shepherds were going to take that risk. If Mary and Joseph were really going to dedicate their lives to this baby boy. What child is this really? But it wasn't just people who loved him. There were people who rejected him too. And this question mattered a lot to them. It mattered a lot To Herod, for example, what child this is. You know, we're going to ask that question this morning because it's a fair question. You know, for each of us to be able to answer that, who is Jesus? How does his, his life confirm this birth that we celebrate in December every year? Because the way that we answer that question determines if we really trust him. If we really follow him, if we really obey him, if we really believe him, it all comes back to the answer to that question. What child is this? And as Jesus grew, as he became a man, as he began his ministry, he found himself at times with the people who knew him best and yet had the hardest time understanding who Jesus was. Have you ever felt that? You know, if you're a follower of Christ, and and sometimes it's, it's the only thing you want is for the people you know best, who you love the most, to understand who Jesus is. And sometimes it seems like they're the only ones who just can't understand. Well, Jesus knows what that feels like, because after his baptism, after he faced temptation in the wilderness and overcame that evil... Verse 14 of Luke chapter 4 tells us this, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. He's a hometown boy. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So the picture that you see here is the synagogue at Capernaum. Now I know we just read that he's in Nazareth, so this is just to give you an idea. Because he will go to Capernaum next. And and what would happen is, as they gathered together, and in fact, that's what the word synagogue really means. It's It's a gathering. They would line up on benches, kind of along those side columns, and somebody would stand up in the middle at the far end to read from God's Word. This was a gathering where they got together to study, to enjoy, to understand God's Word. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> hey, we're doing that right now. But, but their service was a little bit different than ours. It, it would begin with a prayer. And as everybody gathered in, and as they opened in prayer, then it would move on to all of them together repeating the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. After that, there would be 18 benedictions that would be read over the people, then a reading from the Torah, from the book of the law in God's word. After the reading from the Torah, there would be a reading from the prophets. And whoever did that reading from the prophets would then teach to help people understand what that prophecy meant before they would close with the Aaronic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, give you peace. And so this is where we find Jesus, that actually a lot like you here this morning, he had made it his custom not to give up meeting together, but to be in that place where people gathered to love God's word. And it just so happens on this day that he's going to be given prophecy to read. And so this, this little door, that little black door to the left, is probably where they kept the scrolls. And somebody would pull one out of there and hand it to somebody to read. And there have been times in my life where I thought prophecy was like the part we skip. Because it's confusing and it's hard to understand. Not only stuff from the Old Testament, but especially stuff about the future. And I'll tell you, if we skip prophecy, that is 
at least lazy <laughs> and probably dangerous because God tells us a lot in prophecy so that we know who Jesus is. You see, that's what we're going to see this morning is that prophecy helps us move from what child is this to, oh, come, let us adore him. Prophecy helps us move from what child is this to, oh, come, let us adore him. Because prophecy is God's supernatural storytelling. That he doesn't just have to look back at history to understand how things happen. He, he doesn't just have to learn from the past, but he can look forward to the future and he tells his people what's coming. So that when it happens, they can believe him. Even when it seems unbelievable. And so, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And it says that when they pulled out that book, that scroll, he was handed the book of Isaiah. And when he opened the book, you can imagine him standing there reading to the people. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Now this is the moment that everybody's waiting to see what he's going to say next. We've had the reading. We know the word. We've heard God's word before. We may even have heard this prophecy before. But now he's supposed to say something about it. <laughs> and as Jesus sat down to teach, this is what he said to them. Today, this scripture, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Right here, right now, fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Much like the people had in other towns. They glorified him. They, what a teacher, what a speaker. And then they ask our question. What, ch what child is this? They said, is this not Joseph's son? Remember, this is the place where Jesus grew up. This is Nazareth that he called home. There were probably people in this synagogue that he had seen for years as they gathered together. People who would say, isn't that, isn't that Joseph's son? I, I thought he was just a tradesman. I, I thought he was just learning stoneworking and, and woodworking. And Where did he learn to teach like that? Where did he learn to understand prophecy like that? What child is this? Really? Well, I love the fact that the way Jesus answers that question is the way that Jesus often answers the question when Jesus is trying to help people understand who Jesus is. He used the Old Testament. He used God's Word. In fact, this is the kind of thing that we see him do after his resurrection when he gathered all of his disciples together and started from the beginning of the Old Testament and it says he worked all the way through and told them, revealed to them what all of that scripture had meant about him. Same thing he did on the road to Emmaus when he met two disciples who didn't even recognize him and he began in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in the prophets and explained to them how everything had been pointing to the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. Same thing his disciples did into the book of Acts. When they had learned this from Jesus, when they went back out to tell other people, they said, well, first, let me start with what God said hundreds, even thousands of years ago, because it's coming true right here, right now. This prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. And so to move from what child is this to, oh, come, let us adore him. The first thing that we've got to do is we've got to understand the prophecy about why Jesus was sent. And this prophecy that we see in Luke 4, 18 and 19 actually comes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. 
And as you read this, you can see in red on the screen there, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me. And then each of those red statements becomes a purpose statement for Jesus' ministry. A purpose statement. The reason that he is here. The reason that God has sent him in the flesh to be the Messiah. To preach the gospel. To heal. To proclaim liberty. Recovery of sight. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, his audience would know this. But if you actually turn back to Isaiah 61, and you don't have, you can if you want, you don't have to, I'll turn there for you. Isaiah 61 actually says this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now they would know that that's what comes next. They've heard this read before, and yet Jesus stops here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I I heard one pastor describe it this way. That we are living in Isaiah's comma. Because what they may not have understood, but what Jesus knew, was that the day of vengeance would come. right? That the time would come when God was going to finally, ultimately, and completely defeat evil and, and wipe it off the face of creation. But that was going to be at his second coming. Here, now, as Jesus stood before them, and as his word stands before us this morning, this is the good news. Because the acceptable year of the Lord actually refers to the year of Jubilee. And if you remember our study in Leviticus, we discovered that the year of Jubilee was a time when debts were canceled. It was a time when every debt could be forgiven. That's the good news. You see, Jesus is here to preach forgiveness in the kingdom of God. And as you look at the rest of those verses, not only the purpose statements, he's also answering who he came for, who he was sent to. You know, as you look at this list, I think sometimes we don't necessarily see ourselves here to preach the gospel to the poor. Well, probably not a lot of us think of ourselves as poor. I mean, we know there are poor people out there. We see them, and sometimes cash is hard to come by for us, but especially when we look on a global scale, well, I don't know if that really means me. Well, brokenhearted, that's the next one. Certainly, most of us have felt what it's like to be brokenhearted. And especially this time of year, there are many of us for whom this may be the first Christmas where somebody's missing. And maybe the Tenth Christmas where somebody's missing. But times like this with family just always remind us that there are things that hurt in this world. But captives, blind, oppressed, I don't know. I want you to think about this maybe a little bit differently. Because here's the reality. On a very literal sense, Jesus certainly came for the poor. We saw him spend a lot of time with people who financially would be described by this word. He certainly came for people who were brokenhearted. He certainly came for the people of Israel who, when Isaiah wrote this, were captives. Literally. He certainly came for people who were being oppressed by the evil that was happening around them, even in the Roman Empire. But you'll notice in a few weeks when we come back to Luke chapter 6 Jesus uses a lot of this same kind of language when he teaches the Beatitudes he says blessed are the poor blessed are those who mourn is it possible that that this isn't just material wealth or poorness but that he's actually talking about people who are poor in spirit spiritually poor people who desperately need a savior because there's nothing that they, that we, can do to repay our own debts. And that maybe, it's not just brokenhearted by things that happen around us. Is, is it possible that, that when we realize how spiritually poor we are, we actually become heartbroken over our own brokenness? When we realize that we may not be captives in a physical sense, But because of our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, 
the sin that separates us from one another and from God, we've become captives to our own sin. That the things that, that we give into become so normal to us that we become blind to them. And we can't even see how much it's hurting us anymore. To the point that we become oppressed by the effects of our sin, by the effects of sin of people around us. What do we do? Well, Jesus opened Isaiah 61 to tell you what he'll do. Because he's got good news for the poor in spirit. That they can't earn their way to God, but he can forgive their debts. That he can heal the brokenhearted no matter what it is that's tearing you apart. That he can set you free no matter what it is that holds you back. That he can give sight to you that when you can't even see what might be going wrong, he can see it, he can show you, he can heal it, he can set you free. I think... That is worth being thankful for. In fact, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> a couple weeks ago at Thanksgiving, maybe your family does this, our, our family does this, where you go around the table and everybody says something they're thankful for. Well, we did that as a family, but then a couple hours later, we're, we're sitting in the living room and, and we're just hanging out and we're listening to music. And I'm sitting by my son, Simeon, and he's four years old. And, and we're listening to this song by Hawk Nelson called, Thank God for Something. And every time the chorus comes around and he sings, Go ahead and thank God for something. And it sounds just like that, I promise you. <laughs> every time that would come, we would shout something out. Not, not just that we're thankful for, but that we thank God for. And it was so much fun. And, and one of the times that that came around, this little guy sitting next to me shouts, Isaiah's prophecies. Really? Like, I mean, I mean, yeah, if I think about it, definitely. But who even taught you to pronounce it like that? <laughs> it's probably more accurate, but I don't say it that way. So, but as I thought about it, you know, he knows a lot of Isaiah's prophecies because he's got these songs that have the words of the Bible just set to music. And so he's heard a bunch of them. So we just turned them on and we started listening through. And I was just overwhelmed hearing them back to back to back at everything that God had told us the Messiah would do. And I'll tell you what, in that moment, I'm not wondering what child is this. I'm saying, come let us adore him. You see, that's what happens. When we understand the prophecy, then we adore the one who fulfills the prophecy. We adore the one who fulfills the prophecy. Now look, how often do you use the word adore? Probably at Christmas when you sing, oh, come let us adore him right? I don't use that word very often. I'm a guy, okay? I don't adore things, and I don't think things are adorable, right? So, but I, I want you to think about this a little bit differently, because when we use that word, it's not just like teddy bears and baby penguins and, and stuff like that, you know? So, so I guess that probably tells you what I think is adorable, but really not adorable. We're talking about adoration. You see, in the idea of adoration is when I see something that is so amazing, when I see someone who is so powerful, who is so good, who does something I just can't even imagine, that I can't help but say, wow, <laughs> did you see that? He's amazing. Like a really, really low-level example of this is like back in the day watching the Chicago Bulls and you see Michael Jordan take off from the free throw line. He's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. And then he slams it home, and it's just like the crowd erupts. Wow. Okay, it's that, but like infinitely more so. That when I realize how desperate my need is for somebody else to lift me up, and I find it in Jesus. Wow. Wow. Like Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He can handle it. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Or Micah 5.2, 
that speaks a prophecy about the very place he would be born. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. This is King Jesus. See, in Isaiah 1, it says that our sins are like scarlet, but that they can be white as snow. In Isaiah 40, it says that he loves us so much that in his tender arms, he gathers us like a shepherd gathers sheep. But in Isaiah 53, it says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And yet, Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. In Isaiah 59, it says that God went looking over the earth for somebody who could bring salvation. Somebody who could do righteousness. And he found nobody. So he did it himself. With his own strong arm. That's why in Isaiah 61... He can promise us this healing. Because he is the great physician. Because this is the child who fulfills the prophecy. Because God so loved the world. Because he adores you. You see, when we understand the prophecy about why he was sent, then we adore the one who fulfills the prophecy... And I want you to discover how he adores you. Because after Jesus had taught them this, told them it would be fulfilled in their hearing, now Jesus does this thing that you're going to see him do time and time again because he knows our hearts even better than we do. Before anybody even responds, he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician. You're talking about healing? Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we've heard done in Capernaum, all those miracles and things, do also here in your country. Right? You're a hometown boy. This is Jesus of Nazareth. Let's see some of that good stuff. Now, I totally understand this. All right, we, we get this mindset, don't we? I, I experienced this just last weekend. My wife and I were down at the music hall, and we were there for holiday pops, and they had a guest singer, Liz Calloway. Liz Calloway, I, I, I don't know. But hey, this will be fun. But then as she starts singing, I'm thinking, I think I recognize this voice. And, and then she told us it's because she was the voice of Anastasia in the movie Anastasia. And so, unfortunately, that means I have to admit to you, I kind of liked that movie. And so I recognized the voice. And I thought, okay, that is kind of cool after all. You know, yay! But I'll tell you, the biggest applause of the whole day was not at the finale. It was when she told us that she went to CCM Right here in Cincinnati. Oh, yeah! Because now it's not world-famous Liz Calloway. It's our world-famous Liz Calloway. Sing for us like you sing for Hollywood. And we're just having all kinds of fun. Like, that's the moment that Jesus is in right now. Isn't this Joseph's son? That is Joseph's son. That's our boy. He's gonna, that, All that stuff we've heard him doing, he's going to do that for us. You see, what's happening is, what Jesus recognizes is... They're excited, but really they want God to come to them on their own terms. How often do we do that? I'll just pick on myself. How often do I do that? Because I know that I do. Where there's times that I say, yes, Jesus, this sounds wonderful. All this stuff is good. And so if you would just do this thing over here and that thing over there, fix this thing over here and heal this thing up here, oh, I will worship you. Right? And it's not that it's bad to pray for those things. Because Jesus is not against miracles and he's not against healing people. He did it a lot. But Jesus wanted to come on his own terms because he had something so much better in mind. Because he's not just looking at the here and now. Those miracles were really just to back up who he said he was so that we would trust him for forever. And so in verse 24, he said... Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, 
When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath, not an Israelite, to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. This would be a woman in desperate need, who had nothing left. But not only to her, also it says, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, except Naaman, the Syrian. See, there's two things going on here. One is that Jesus is indicating to them that although Israel is the people of God, the Messiah is here for everyone. But not only that, there's a difference here between people who reject him and people who adore him. Because in that time, there were prophets They were bringing the word of God and the people of God were not listening. And so God says, well, then we'll go to the people who are listening. right, we'll go to the people who are ready to respond. A widow who had desperate need and Naaman, who 2 Kings 5.19 describes as a great and honorable man, a man who probably had no need he couldn't meet himself. Except that one thing, that, that leprosy. That thing that only God can heal. And so Jesus is implying to these people in his hometown that he is here to do what only God can do. Because he's God. Because he is the child who fulfills the prophecy. You see, whether you are spiritually poor, whether you feel like you're broken hearted, Whether you've begun to recognize spiritual blindness in yourself that has made you captive to sin so that you've been oppressed by the effects of sin. When you feel like you have nothing left or when you feel like you're actually doing okay. All of us have a desperate need for the great physician who heals in a way that only God can heal. When we adore the one who fulfills prophecy, then we find that healing. But Jesus anticipates their rejection. And he's right, because in verse 28 it says that all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. So they went from glorifying him, fixed on his words, excited to hear it, filled with wrath, and rose up. And thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. This is a turn of events, right? I mean, think about what has just happened in a person's heart to go from, that's our guy, kill him. Now, let me just take a moment here and say, let's not talk about me, but let's talk about Chad. If you're ever listening to Chad and you don't really like what he's saying, you know, we believe in challenging teaching here at Horizon, but don't throw him off a cliff, okay? I I like Chad. Chad's a friend of mine, all right? (laughs) Jesus brings challenging teaching. It pushes people's hearts, and they made a choice, right? Because we all have that moment. We're either going to reject or we're going to adore. And I think in a strange way, they might have gotten the miracle that they were kind of asking for. Because this whole crowd pushes him to the edge of the cliff. And verse 30 says, passing through the midst of them. How did they not notice? He went his way. It's like that weird moment in all those movies where, is he dead? I think so. Well, can you see him? No, but I'm, I'm sure he's dead. I, that person is always coming back, right? That's how you know they're not. And you see, what's important here is that Jesus faced rejection, but he didn't quit. He didn't give up. He went somewhere else, but he didn't give up. And he didn't skip them either. Even knowing what they might do, he gave them this message. And he told his disciples, he tells us, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a brother or sister in the Lord today, you probably know what that feels like. When you love them so much, you want them to know Jesus, who Jesus is, so they can adore him like you adore him. And they reject it. Jesus told his followers... When they hate you, remember, they hated me first. When they reject you, don't take it personally. They're really rejecting me. But he didn't give up. In fact, in the next ten verses or so, 
Jesus continued to go to synagogue after synagogue after synagogue, and Capernaum, the one you see there, was next. And you see the difference between what they cast out when they cast out Jesus and what he casts out when we adore the child who fulfills prophecy. Verses 31 to 37 say that Jesus cast out demons, and even the demons knew what child this is. They called him the Christ, and he told them to keep silent. Verses 38 and 39, Jesus casts out disease from Peter's mother-in-law. And you better believe that when we get to chapter 5 in the new year, that Peter remembers that and he's listening just a little bit more closely when Jesus says, keep fishing. Because he's seen what this child is. Verses 40 to 41, almost like a summary, describes how Jesus was casting disease out of everyone and demons out of many. See, he didn't quit because he knew there were people out there like that widow, like Naaman, people who were ready to respond to who Jesus is. In fact, that's really why Horizon is here. And I would say if you are part of our our synagogue, if you're part of this gathering, I don't know if you think about it this way, But I believe that is why you are here. Because there are people that you know that I don't know, and and Chad doesn't know, and Doug doesn't know, but there are people that you know who are like that widow, who are like Naaman, who are ready to respond to who Jesus is, and they might just be waiting for an invitation from you. They might just be waiting for one more opportunity, one more moment. You see, that's what Jesus kept doing. Verse 42 says that when it was day, he departed, went into a deserted place. But these crowds from all these other towns, they sought him and came to him, tried to keep 